Hi, and welcome back to uh, you, Regina 120. Uh, this is the 121st video of the 120 video series uh, about things that I learned as a computer science student at the University of Regina. Uh, I got a Bachelor of Computer Science that needed 120 credit hours, and in fact, I needed each class gave about three credit hours, and I was told to get 120, and I absolutely did get 120. I graduated a, a, with a degree, a Bachelor of Science uh, in that field, and uh, of course, I got to 120 credit hours, and then was told, no, that's not enough. You need to actually get another three credit hours for some reason because, a, of all things, computer error. So we're not done yet. We got more videos to take. Uh, now, these videos are not necessarily going to be as long as some of the other videos. Uh, we are starting to get to the simple ideas, uh, the things that you just get kind of told, you kind of note, and then kind of make sure that you remember, uh, and they're kind of general uh, ideas or, or specific things that aren't all that complicated, uh, but I think you should know anyway, uh, including this one. So this is actually kind of a personal belief. Uh, I'm still kind of open to having this, uh, you know, you're, you're welcome to disagree and, and argue with me on this one. Uh, but when I was a high school student and an elementary school student, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on learning math especially uh, and not using a calculator to, to learn that math. And that you, yes, you, you could of course have a calculator in your life, but a calculator doesn't belong in school because you want to make sure that you remember your, you know, 8 times 8 is 64 and, you know, 5 times 5 is 25 or whatever the, the numbers are and whatever the operation is. And then as you grew older, uh, they may let you use a regular calculator, but you couldn't use a scientific calculator. Uh, and then you could use a scientific calculator, and that was okay, uh, but you couldn't use a statistics calculator. And then you could use a statistics calculator, but you couldn't use a graphics calculator, uh, or graphing calculator. And then you could use a graphing calculator, but you couldn't use a programmable graphing calculator. And then you couldn't use a program, or you could use a programmable cal graphing calculator, but you couldn't use a computer. And, uh, or you could use a computer, but you couldn't use the internet. Uh, and, or, or maybe you could use some parts of the internet, but not the whole internet, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. And so I have noticed in my lifetime, technology has advanced. Uh, calculators were still, I mean, they, they had existed for quite some time. Uh, but technology diffused throughout the world uh, at rates uh, that were not immediate, especially back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, where you know you couldn't find out about the latest iPhone or iGadget or iWatch or whatever uh, at the speed of a tweet uh, going from kind of one person to another to another uh, within about you know five seconds of each other faster than the waves of an earthquake, for example. That is not something that you would have experienced if you had lived in the 80s and 90s. You might have heard something on the radio if you were listening to the radio at that time. You might have heard something on TV if you were listening to the TV at that time. And you might have, you know, over time, as people talked about it in coffee shops and coffee rooms and in the schoolyard and, you know, as, as different social groups found out about different things. Uh, but a lot of the time, especially in technology, it didn't confuse all that quickly because people didn't have the money to buy it. And they didn't have the, the um, interest in, in changing the way that they lived uh, all that quickly. And I mean, that happened anyway. Uh, there were personal computers in my elementary school back when I was still an elementary school student, there were personal computers in my high school, when I was a high school student, and even some of the ones in my high school were connected to the internet, which was actually kind of a new thing, and of course the World Wide Web, which also was kind of a new thing. Uh, and so, with time, uh, people in authority, uh, so going back to the argument for authority with them, uh, and, and when they make decisions, uh, and have to decide what you are and are not allowed to use, uh, oftentimes, Technology changes how we view what we should know, and how we view what we should learn, and how we should learn. And there's, a, it's it's not a, a decided matter of what students should and should not have access to in the classroom. Uh, if you go back into the 70s, uh, to the very first people who were talking about uh, computers and what computers would mean for society, like Marshall McLuhan and Alvin Toffler, uh, they were already talking about how do we put computers, these massive behemoths, of steel and electricity uh, and you know, spinning tapes and stuff like that. How do we put them in a classroom? Uh, and they were thinking about it. They wasn't, weren't really all that far towards uh, how you could actually use uh, technology in the classroom like that. Whereas today, we've got stuff like Google Glass 
uh, although Google Glass, I think, kind of went defunct a little bit. Uh, but certainly, the you know glasses uh, screens are coming, uh, and it's just a matter of social acceptance at this point, uh, not necessarily a technology problem uh, or a, even a money problem. I think that by and large, people when this hits the street and people are ready for it, you'll be able to afford it, even if you're kind of the middle or lower middle class, uh, if they you know, want it badly enough. But the, 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 the technology is kind of available to do things, like give students calculators in their classroom. And so even if you're in a place like uh, Ottawapiskat, uh, where they're having problems with water uh, and housing and stuff like that, uh, there is money in this country. There, there is enough resources that every student in Ottawapiskat, I don't know if they do or not, maybe they do, uh, but they, they should have a calculator. And there's really no technical reason or financial reason other than, you know, the kind of great filter, the great white combine, the things that are the institutional barriers keeping people from, you know, having enough resources to be successful. Uh, there are those sorts of things, but on a technical level, there's no reason why you couldn't have a, at least a calculator. And this doesn't just expand to tools that are used for calculating. This doesn't just, ex you know, extend to the difference engine and its relatives, or maybe even 3D printers. You know, 3D printers are kind of a new thing. But I think with time, we're going to run into the same problem with 3D printers, where students are not going to be able to use them in classes. They're not going to be able to bring them in their pockets to classes, because the teachers won't understand that, oh, maybe you'll want to print a ball for playing ball during you know, gym time or something like that, uh, and that you want to be able to you know, control the game to that extent with like a little rubbery ball or whatever students are going to use these printers for. I don't know, that's the, 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 the future uh, waiting to be invented there. But uh, regardless about three, you know, what the technology is, there's going to be decisions about what you can and cannot bring with you into a classroom. And so one of the biggest decisions uh, that I have remembered is bringing your textbook or bringing your book notebook or bringing your source material uh, for an exam or for a classroom or for uh, you know purposes that you could refer to it, uh, and uh, it is useful to be able to memorize. For example, tables of integration. Uh, you go back to the integral calculus video. Uh, you can you know, note that there's a whole bunch of different integrals that uh, relate uh, you know, rates of change and uh, or kind of integrals that they're related to, and that you basically just have to memorize a lot of them. Uh, and so. One way of getting around that would be to just bring a book of integrals, uh, so that you kind of have like little bookmarks in them, so that you know where in the book you want to look for different kinds of problems. Going back to the polya video and sorting mathematical problems by the way that you can solve them, that, that's one approach. Uh, but the, you know, I, I, I distinctly remember being told on at least a couple of midterms and final exams, like don't bring anything into this exam. If you bring anything more complicated than like a B2 or 2B pencil, uh, then you can get expelled and we'll do all these horrible things to you and stuff like that. Um, and I always thought that you should be able to, you should be allowed to bring material, your textbook, your, uh, you know, a book like uh, the, you know, Beyond Good and Evil by Nietzsche, if you have a uh, philosophy exam, or, or maybe a uh, uh, artificial intelligence and modern approach if you have an AI exam, uh, or you know, whatever the, the textbook of choice is. Uh, but of course, the problem with textbooks is that they're, um, they take up a lot of space. So you don't necessarily want to bring a lot of textbooks. And so you wouldn't think to, for example, bring your entire library with you uh, as you go to an exam uh, with like a, a well-built index. And I haven't really talked about indexes and how they work uh, on a computer science level. Uh, but if, you know, you, you wouldn't want to bring one of those uh, in um, to an exam because that would just not be done, and nobody would want to do that because, uh, well, first of all, it would take up a lot of space and a lot of room, uh, but most importantly, the teachers wouldn't approve of it because that would be you bringing in something to the exam, giving you an unfair advantage over your peers, for example, unless, of course, all your peers were allowed to bring the same thing, then it would be kind of like an open book exam. And then, yes, those open book exams exist, but, um, and strangely enough, the professors who do those open book exams, although they may have to do a little bit more work, uh, usually end up with roughly the same kind of grade curve or grade average curve uh, that you get otherwise. But of course, they don't want to do extra work, so they'll prefer that you just don't bring your, your books. But what am I getting at here? Is that there is a way to think about this problem uh, of what you can bring to an exam where you would be allowed to bring 
your textbooks or your notebooks, etc. With one caveat, which is that if you choose to bring your textbook to that exam and to get your grade, going back to the grades video, on that exam, then I think that you should, from that point onward in your life, uh, have to carry that textbook around with you everywhere, everywhere that you go, so that if you are ever called on to use the knowledge that you claim to have as part of that exam, as the act of doing that exam, that you'll be able to read through your textbook and know where it is, and that you can use your muscle memory as the thing, the key, the number, the algorithm, the, the plan of how to get that knowledge in a robust way. The important thing is to make sure that that knowledge is stored within you, and if it's in me muscle memory, that, in my mind, is acceptable or not. But, you have to bring the textbook with you from that point onward. And so this would have been a very difficult thing, say, 20 years ago, when you, uh, if you wanted to bring, say, for example, a table of integrals around with you, it was a thick book, you know? You, it was possible to carry it around in a backpack or something. And so maybe you get to the point where you, you just always have a backpack with you, say, four or five books on it. Uh, and it's a little heavy sometimes. Sometimes you have to run with it. It's kind of uncomfortable and all, but it's a, an acceptable trade-off, right? To For being able in that one exam to just being able to draw from that knowledge. And then each student would be able to choose different books that they would carry around with them. And then as a whole, people would just have these large things of knowledge that didn't quite fit in their head, but were accessible immediately. And that you could organize society based on this. This seemed to be a good idea, even with paper. However, with computers, things change. And things become a lot easier. Because suddenly you don't need to carry the textbook around with you that weighs 10 pounds on its own. Because you can get an iPhone or an Android uh, or a Google Glass or something like it that can store gigabytes of data. Uh, I have probably in a thumb drive at this point a large number of large enough number of books, books alone, not not even counting other kinds of data, that would have challenged the size of uh, the bookmobile, the you know, book trailer full of books that drove to my neighborhood as a kid, easily. Like, not even like a little bit of a contest there that I, as an individual, have more books that I can carry around with me with no problem at all. No issue of how much am I going to, you know, how, how heavy is this going to be? You know, I, I can fit this on a keychain. I can fit this on, you know, a, a little thing fit into my pocket uh, that I can back up and always have. Read. And that this suddenly is a technically possible thing to do. And the thing keeping this idea from being implemented was just about 10 years of computer technology aided by Moore's Law that suddenly allows us to act on it. Now, people don't. By and large, I'm the only person I've heard who's ever said this. Uh, but I think that you, as a potential student, should think about it at least. Think about arguing for it. Think about talking to your teachers about it. Think about talking to your government about it. Because chances are this isn't an individual decision. This is going to be a collective action problem where as a society, as an internet, as a world, we, we come to accept that the knowledge doesn't have to be stored in any particular kind of way in order for it to be useful. And then maybe there's a broader discussion that has to happen about how quickly we have to be able to regurgitate that knowledge and in what form we have to be able to connect that knowledge to the other things in our heads. So for example, if it's on paper in a book of integrals, is it really being connected to the other things? Looking at the can you use the result video for more details about that. Uh, but you know, is, is it really happening? And are there ways that once it's on a computer system that we can start to connect it to those other things in ways that we couldn't if it was on paper? That's a good question, and a question that I think that you, as a watcher of this video, should be asking. And should be asking people who deal with these systems and deal with textbook systems. One direction we should not be going uh, is to be blocking these uh, textbooks uh, with DRM, and keeping people from doing creative and innovative things like this, and making it so that you can't do this. You can't take your textbook with you, because if you could, uh, or if you tried to take a DRM lock textbook with you, the DRM manufacturer, whoever owns the textbook, and you don't own that textbook, it's locked with DRM. You are just leasing it from someone temporarily until their server goes down or until their uh, light, you know, ability to give you the license, to give you the key, stops working. Uh, then suddenly, uh, you no longer have that knowledge, and it is no longer your, uh, you know, available to you. And so you should go back and get that that test again. Uh, without that textbook. Uh, 
go to that resource of that source. Same thing goes with calculators. Uh, if your ability to use a computer system has uh, some kind of a lock on it that will only allow you to use it sometimes or for some period of time, then you should not use that because this does not uh, would not allow you to always carry it with you, to always have that computer with you. So this is kind of taking the first steps of describing why you should avoid these DRM systems. This is video, of course, is not a full argument on that level. Uh, you could, of course, always use DRM systems for things not related to carrying textbooks around with you for the rest of your life. That would be, you know, at least in the context of this video, uh, something that you could conceivably do. But I think that for those textbooks, you should avoid DRM, always have them on your computer, always have your computer on you, always have a personal computer available for you to personally use. Uh, if you need to, you know, put it on the cloud, that might be an acceptable way to do it. Uh, we could talk about that as well. But the important thing is that if you use knowledge that you don't explicitly put into your head, make sure that that knowledge always is somewhere that you can access uh, and that you remember how to access it in a time-sensitive way. Seems like a reasonable idea. Hopefully it is. Um, if you have any questions or would like to discuss this idea, uh, feel free to post your questions or comments anywhere where this video is posted. And uh, hopefully uh, we will, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you think that this is a good idea and you want to support political advo advocacy uh, about this idea, uh, send me some Bitcoin so I can organize some kind of a campaign about it. Uh, as per the Bitcoin address at the bottom of the screen here. Although, if, if you do that, make sure that you also leave a comment saying why you're setting the Bitcoin so that I can understand that that's what you want. Uh, and uh, I guess we'll see if there's another video after this.